Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 5. <clears throat> Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 42. We'll complete this chapter um, tonight. As you can see, um, I've decided to trim my beard and all. And um, one thing I learned as a husband, you know, I should have cleared up with my wife. <clears throat> So now I have to uh, give me just a few more weeks. It'll, it'll get there. It'll get there. All right. Again, thank you guys for coming. Acts chapter 5. So in our last study, we saw how God dealt with internal opposition. Opposition that came in the form of a lie from one married couple named Ananias and Sapphira. Their lie was born from the father of lies himself, Satan. Their lie was born, you know, the, the, the lie was against the Holy Spirit. And we saw how God brought judgment upon Ananias and Sapphira through death. During a very vital period when the church was young, when the church was growing, and, and, and the last thing that we, the, church, the church needed at that time was corruption, within the church. So God dealt with that internal conflict, that internal opposition. But this is what I love about God, the triune God. No matter what roadblocks, obstacles, or whatever the enemy Satan will throw, it will never stop God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit from doing their work. Amen? So can you imagine after Adam and Eve's rebelliousness and their disobedience that God's final word to humanity was, what is this that you have done, and then that's it? But God didn't do that. He moved forward, not only revealing the consequences of their sin, but also revealed the remedy for their sin called redemption that would come by way of his son Jesus. Likewise, with the church, the Spirit was not going to allow trouble from within nor trouble from without to stop God's redemptive work from going forward. Even today, God ensured that the church would not become this shrinking violet, but to powerfully move forward with the Spirit, and he has been doing that ever since then. In our study, we will see how God does not intervene in the way he did with Ananias and Sapphira, but allow the church to suffer under persecution of the Sanhedrin that will be a sort of the catalyst of many persecutions that were to come against the church. Yet God will also use one man indirectly to help the church. Furthermore, it gives us an insight of how er the early church leaders dealt with external conflict through their obedience and resolve towards Jesus. They remain faithful to Christ. But let's be clear here. The hero here is God. God is always the hero. And the title of this message is God Overcoming External Opposition. So, let's look at verse 12 through 16. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest uh, dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least a shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns and around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. In these five verses alone, we see the church continuing to strive and to grow. What happened with Ananias and Sapphira did not stop the church, but they continued to gather together, and in particular, one place, Solomon's portico, which was in the area of the temple, located near, at the temple area. And then verse 13 showed that none of the rest dared join them, 
that is over at Solomon's portico, but the people held them in high esteem. Maybe some dare not um, join the church after hearing how God dealt with Ananias and Sapphira, right? Maybe they were afraid of the religious authority who weren't really popular. The church was not popular with their religious authority or the religious establishment. They really looked down at this new community of believers, Jesus followers. Or maybe they were just afraid of committing themselves to Jesus. How many people you know that you have witnessed to Jesus and they're afraid to make that commitment right now? They come up with all kinds of excuses, right? They're afraid. But notice that the people, meaning the unsaved, view Jesus' followers with high esteem. And what an amazing testimony from the church to the unsaved world. The church showing generosity, showing God's love, helping and all. And they were viewed with high esteem. And the apostles did signs. They, they, during this period at the early church, they continue. God allowed them to continue to do signs and wonders, healing the sick. Even Peter's shadow, if they, you know, just lay him there. If Peter's shadow comes by, man, they'll get healed. How awesome is that? Many people were bringing the sick and demon-possessed to be healed, even from places just outside of Jerusalem. For me, it's like a foreshadow of the gospel now reaching beyond Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria. And we are told that more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And this is the first time that here Luke, the author, mentions the addition of women. It doesn't mean that women were not in the church or in the fellowship. And also Luke really, at this point, you know, dispenses with actual numbers. We started out with what? 12. Then 120. Then 2,000. Or was it 3,000? And then 5,000. Now it's just what? Multitudes. Can you imagine if that was happening today here in Sacramento? Are we still praying for our state? Are we still praying for our city? And it says that they added, there was multitudes. I mean, people were coming, if not by the hundreds, by the thousands. Furthermore, through the Holy Spirit, the church was having a profound influence in Jerusalem. In my copy of J. Oswald Sanders' classic book, Spiritual Leadership, Principles of Excellence for Every Believer, Oswald Sanders shared, a single life has immense, immense possibility for good or ill. We leave an indelible impact on people who come within our influence, even when we are not aware of it. And one person he shared was Dr. John Getty, born in 1815 and died in 1872. He was born in Scotland, was called the father of foreign missions in the Presbyterian Church in Canada. John Getty went as a missionary to Antietam, a Polynesian island, in 1848 and worked there for 24 years. Written in his memory are these words. When he landed in 1848, there were no Christians. When he left in 1872, there were no heathen. Influence. Are we being an influence to people around us? One man making an impact for the kingdom of God, can we still be an influence in our society today? Absolutely. You can be an influence at your workplace. You can be an influence with your neighbors. And do I dare say family members? That's probably one of the harder ones, huh? But not everyone in Jerusalem was happy about the impact the church had in their communities, let alone the temple area where the apostles were meeting and teaching the name of Jesus. Look at verse 17 and 18. But the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. This time around, the religious authority didn't just get Peter and John. They found all the apostles. The high priests from within the Sanhedrin, especially um, the Sadducees, were filled 
with jealousy. And the word jealousy here in the Greek is zealous, where we get our English word for zeal or zealot. As used here, jealousy means a deeply devoted zeal and earnest concern, as well as envy and even rage. In this case, the Sadducees in particular were so full of their political zeal against the growing church that in their rage, they went and searched out all the apostles and had them all arrested and put in prison. In their zeal, in their jealousy, they didn't... I mean, think about this for a minute. All the good that was going on in Jerusalem, people were being taken care of. People didn't have food before. They were getting fed. People that needed help or monetary or whatever, they were getting help here. And people that were, I mean, they were bringing people that were sick and people were getting healed. And you would think the people in the Sanhedrin would say, I want to join up with you guys. You guys are awesome. What, what, what can we do to partner up with you? That did not happen at all. Jealousy. Jealousy. They didn't even see the good the church was doing for the people in Jerusalem, only that the church was growing in influence over the people, especially when they heard that multitudes of people had come to Jesus and had joined this growing community of people called the church. See, for them, in their thinking, when you start losing your influence over people, you will begin to lose control over people. Does that sound familiar? It's happening today. Verse 19 through 21a. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened. Now, as a retired prison guard, I, I can really appreciate this story, so bear with me. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Remember, the church is still young. And God was not doing, I mean, God was not going to allow the church uh, to be stopped because we have a group of people having a, a, a jealous fit. You know, I mean, they're like this terrible bad children, you know. And here, you know, God had more work to do. And this is a great reminder when the world, the flesh, and Satan goes against us for being a child of God, God does not sit idly, okay? He will help us in times of need so that we can move forward. And even when our faith is being challenged, you know, pray to God to help you in your faith so that you can move forward as well. And why is that? Because we are a people empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what? What is called? The helper. What else is he called? Comforter. What else is he called? Mighty counselor. What else is he called? Prince of Peace. What about dynamite? <laughs> or if you're back, like I said before, back in the 70s, dynamite. Dunamis. That's the word dunamis. So we have the indwelling of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So God sent an angel of the Lord in the middle of the night to bust out his apostles out of jail. I mean, to me, how cool is that? An angel of the Lord leading a jailbreak? Who, could, you know, who thinks of that? This one angel opened the jail doors and personally led the apostle out, but for what purpose? Not to just save their lives. It's like, you know, guys, appreciate what you did earlier today. Now go home and be with your family. No. He said, hey, the break of dawn, you're going back out there and you're going to continue to preach the gospel. And that's what happens. And the ESV in the Amplified Bible capitalizes the word life in reference to Jesus, who is the life. But in other um, versions, it's got the small letter you know, L for life, but it also re uh, refers to the message of salvation that leads to a new life found in Jesus. So it's early in the morning, 
in obedience to what the angel of the Lord instructed them to do, they all went back to the place where they were arrested over at Solomon's portico, that one area over at the temple, and they began to continue to preach the name of Jesus. The very thing they told them not to do back in um, Acts chapter 4, verse 18. I have no doubt that God used a supernatural being like an angel to encourage them to continue in their calling, to preach and to teach Jesus. And by standing firm after their public arrest, which was a persecution, by the way, all right, it helped also to strengthen the church. So can you imagine that morning? It's like people know, it's like, wait a minute, were they not arrested the night before? or the day before, and then to see them all out there again? Hmm, what's going on here, right? But the religious authority was in for a surprise. Look at verse 21b through 25. Now, when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought but when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and guards standing at the door, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. I love the order of that. They, they had to explain that, hey, the place was secured, but there was no one in there. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these, thing, these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. The word council in the Greek is um, Sanhedrion, where we get the word the Sanhedrin. It is the ruling council, or let's, one way of looking at it, they were like the religious supreme court among the uh, Jewish people that consist of both Pharisees who believed in the resurrection, and the supernatural, like angelic beings. And the other part of the uh, Sanhedrin was the dominant party, which were the Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrections and miracles and, and uh, angelic beings and such. So all the big guns were all called in in, this, in the council. They were all called in at the Sanhedrin. And, all right, everyone's here? All right. Bring all the apostles out. But surprise, surprise, the temple officers, again, they reported back. And again, I just love how they explained everything. The place was secure. The doors were locked. Guards were posted and everything, but no apostles. But take a moment and appreciate Dr. Luke's attention to detail here. Notice the word prison doors. It's in the plural. It's doors. Not a door, but doors meaning there were multiple prison cells in there. If there's multiple prison cells in there, there's got to be quite a few prison guards there as well. Also, the prison doors were locked and secured. Think about that, all right? And, last, and, and then I'm thinking like, okay, this is first century, all right? I would imagine that, you know, they didn't have WD-40 back then, nothing to keep the sound down. I'm sure when they opened the gates, it was creaking and everything. And then lastly, but more importantly, guards were posted out the uh, cell doors. It's, it's like the Lord blinded their eyes and muted their ears. I mean, they, how does that happen? Think about that. Something supernatural happened. I mean, as a retired correctional officer, prison guard, that would be the escape of the century. Think about that, though. The angel of the Lord working with the apostles. I mean, this was astounding. And they did not see, there's at least 12 apostles. So no one saw at least 12 bodies coming out of the prison cells and then out? No one did. What was important is that they had no prisoners to bring before the Sanhedrin. And it says that the, 
This perplexed the captain of the temple guard, who, by the way, was second in command to the high priest. And he is part of the priestly aristocracy of the Sadducees. This man's got juice. They were perplexed, and they absolutely had no answer. They can't explain what happened. Prisoners disappear even when all the safeguards were in place. But notice the wording, that word perplexed and wondering. They, they, they shared the same definition. They were perplexed or wonder about them, wondering what this would come to. The Amplified Bible is similar to that with the King James saying, wondering into what this might grow. Or from the New King James said, they wonder what the outcome would be. Having lost for words the, po- the impossibility of a prison break left them wondering that the reality that, that there was something bigger was at play. And what is interesting about all this is that as if, you know, we know that something supernatural occurred here. But with the Sadducees, quoting from one source, you know, they couldn't admit, even if, the, if, if, if an angel stood before them, they just didn't believe in that. Quote, the Sadducees were the theological liberals of the first century. They didn't believe in miracles like the resurrection or in the existence of angels, close quote. But their strength was really in politics. And they tried to keep the peace between Roman authorities with the Jewish people. But God, to me, I think he has a sense of humor because he goes and performs a supernatural event that the Sadducees don't believe in, and then it happens. And even if they came to terms and it's like, yes, something supernatural happened, they would never admit it because of what they believe. But they, lost, but they about lost their minds when someone pointed out and said, look, the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. Can you imagine the humiliation these authority figures must have experienced. They were not in hiding. Okay, look, it would be one thing if they broke out of prison and then they never saw them again. It's like, babe, we're going to Rome, you know, or we're going to Damascus. No. I mean, for them, it's like, those guys got a lot of boldness to return back, almost for them, the scene of the crime, right? And then they go back and they find them teaching, preaching about Jesus. Verse 26, 28. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So here, the captain of the guards and all, they use a different tactic. This time, they're not going to use force on the apostles in fear that they was going to be stoned. Maybe the ones who wanted to stone the guards, maybe they're the ones in verse 3 where it says, but the people held them in high esteem. Members within the community of believers were truly showing the love of Christ to them, People were especially listening to the apostles' teaching and were bringing, them, were bringing people to them to be healed. As far as these people were concerned at this moment, man, it's like, hey, man, off limits on the church, or we, we, we will stone you. That's what was happening here. It's no wonder members within the Sanhedrin, especially the ruling class of the Sadducees, were upset because... They felt threatened by the godly influence from the church. Standing before the Sanhedrin, the high priest asked the apostle, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Them questioning the apostle was more of a form of a legal or quasi-leader interrogation. The charges in question, again, stems back from um, Acts chapter 4, um, verse 18, where they were charged not to teach about Jesus, to which Peter and John rightly ignored. But one thing they could not deny, 
they could not deny was the effect that their teachings had about Jesus, for it had filled the city of Jerusalem. Underline that word filled. They filled the city of Jerusalem. The word filled means cause to happen or to cause to think. That's a great definition, cause to think, because the teachings of Jesus was filling the minds of the people in Jerusalem. And this ought to encourage us today when we are given the opportunity to share about Jesus, that we learn from Scripture that they leave thinking about Jesus. When Jesus is to be the focus of your conversation when you share the gospel about Jesus, leave them thinking about Jesus. And again, the church was making a major impact in Jerusalem And this was a big concern to the religious authorities. And notice that the high priest, he couldn't even say Jesus' name. He said, this man, this man's blood. I mean, it's like garlic to the vampire, kryptonite to Superman, L.A. Dodgers to the San Francisco Giants. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's the other way around. I get confused with those two teams. What were the apostles, again, charged not to do? I go back again. Acts 4.18, not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus, and they did not comply. And then on top of that, the council desperately wished not to be complicit. It's like, hey, we had nothing to do with Jesus' death. Don't put that blood on us. They're hypocrites. They were were totally involved in the whole thing. I mean, look at at verse 29. This is, I love this, because here the apostles were, we're not going to remain silent here. And Peter, the de facto leader among the disciples, answered back saying, we must obey, rather than, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our, our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey. The apostles' stance has not changed since back in Acts chapter 4, 18. Peter and the other made that principle clearer. If they didn't understand it the first time, they made it clear right here and right now. It's almost like they drew the, the, the line in the sand. We must obey God rather than men. Yes, we are to obey our governing authorities only until they ask us to go against our highest authority, our Lord. Until they cause us to compromise our faith, to go against our God-given convictions, keep us from sharing the gospel, put us in a position to disobey God or to sin against God. Now, in verse 30 to 32, Peter and the apostles pointed out the truth of which they could not deny or hide from. God raised Jesus as their Messiah, whom they killed on the tree. This points to the crucifixion of Jesus. God exalted, along with uh, raising Jesus, God exalted Jesus' position of authority as leader and savior. This points to Jesus' um, resurrection and ascension and offering repentance and forgiveness of sin. This points to salvation through Jesus. I mean, this is like, this is like Christianity 101 right there. These are the truths that they were witness to. And the word witness goes back to the Old Testament, their, their Old Testament code of law. And they took the word witness and the practice of witness very seriously. And the apostles gave true, reliable information, that's the, that's the meaning of witness, along with the Holy Spirit, whom God gave to those in Jesus. But what I love about this, did you notice what um, Peter did here? He shared the gospel. That's what he did here. And I love that he shared it, in, shared it in the most simplest of form that they could understand. I remember how certain Christians from either certain denominations or theological persuasions and stuff were critical about the simplicity of how Billy Graham delivered the gospel message. And, 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 and I'm thinking, why should the gospel not be explained where a child could understand? 
Some folks want to sound clever and sophisticated when they share the gospel, and then people are confused. You know, it's like they don't even know what the gospel means. You know, there is a time and a place to go deeper into the word. But when we share the good news about Jesus, share the truth like Peter did in its simplicity about Jesus, not as if you're giving some kind of a, a doctoral dissertation or a thesis, but in a way that people are able to understand. It's, it's often been said that if you cannot explain something very clearly, chances are is that you don't understand it yourself. Now, after Peter shared the gospel message of Jesus, the Sadducees in particular understood Peter loud and clear. Because look at verse 33, it says that when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. They're, 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 this is beyond being upset, okay? This is going beyond like, hey, I disagree with you, and let's still continue with our kumbaya moment. No, no, no. That was not happening here, Okay? Now, I said we are to share the gospel so people can understand you. How they respond to you, though, that's a whole different matter altogether. Not everyone is going to go in some raging fit, though that might be a possibility because we're seeing that today in many of the Muslim countries. We're seeing that today in many communist countries today. They are very hostile anything that has to do with Jesus. And I think it's happening here. Actually, it's already happening here. Maybe not to the extent where people are getting killed like in other countries, but it's happening here. They rage against the news about the resurrected Jesus as the Messiah. They wanted to kill all the apostles. The reality is that the world will have a natural repulsion or revulsion or a hate for Jesus. That is until, like all of us here, God gets a hold of our heart. Amen? The truth about the Sanhedrin is that they did not have the authority, though, to exercise capital punishment. That was reserved under the uh, Roman jurisdiction. But it was not beyond them, though, to try to circumvent or try to figure out a way to get people executed like they did with Jesus. Who did they go to? They went to Pontius Pilate. So it's not beyond them that they would try to figure out some way and somehow to bring uh, death to God's people. Verse 34, 39a. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the Lord held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody and a number of men. About 400 joined him. He was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them you might even be found opposing who? God. So we here have one prominent leader, named, a Pharisee, named Gamaliel, stood up, stood up at the moment where uh, he intervened, the moment where you know, the, 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 apostle, the apostle was making their stance, they're holding on to their convictions, and at the same time, the, especially the Sadducees, man, they want to kill him. Gamaliel was a Pharisee, and in the Mishnah, which is the oral law of Judaism, says of Gamaliel, since Rabban, Gamaliel, the elder died, there has been no more reverence for the law, and purity and abstinence died out at the same time. This really gives us a, a glimpse of what this man was like. <clears throat> he was once highly um, an esteemed historical figure, a rabbi rabbinical teacher. He basically took after his father, who was very well known and respected amongst God's people. And when he spoke, members of the Sanhedrin listened to him, okay? 
Furthermore, Paul stated that he too was a pupil of Gamaliel based on what he said in Acts chapter 22, verse 3. So Paul learned from the best. After giving orders to remove the apostles from the council, then Gamaliel went ahead and addressed the council, the Sanhedrin. And he cautioned every member of the Sanhedrin how they were to move forward in treating these followers of Jesus. He used the name of Thetis and Judas as examples of earlier insurrectionists who brought their own deaths upon themselves and, and their followers, there were no more. They were scattered abroad. Gamiel pointed out that if this movement is of men, of man, it will die off like these clowns. I mean, like these insurrectionists there. Yeah. Going a little Brooklyn there for a second here. Yeah. However, what the, uh, the apostles are doing in the name of Jesus is of God. There is nothing they can say or do to overthrow the apostles as well as the growing community of the church from what God had started. For they will find themselves opposing God himself. I just want to say that Gamaliel was partially right. And this is what I mean, is that the church was indeed started by a man, but not an ordinary man. And it did not fail because Jesus was what? Fully God and fully what? Fully man. So this movement did not fail, will not fail, because we are here today. We are the testimony. We are the ones, we are part of that movement that started over 2,000 years ago. And we will see later in Acts chapter 9, the name of this one Pharisee, Saul, who will learn this, who will become later Paul, who heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are what? Persecuting. Paul found himself opposing God himself. And Jesus made a special appearance for Paul. <laughs> right? The rock is well is correct. But as a side note, I like to say, though, Though it's not said in the text here, I have no doubt that God orchestrated Gamaliel to speak up. Just as Satan worked, can work in people to lie against the spirit, God was working things out for his apostle, for the sake of the church, and for the sake of his son's name, Jesus. God did not strike anyone down any of the members of the Sanhedrin like he did with Ananias and Sapphira, but he will use whomever he wants to further his work. And in this case, I believe God used Gamiel to speak up. And, what, and also what wisdom or sanity he brought to the council, Gamiel was absolutely not the hero of the apostles, nor was he the salvation of the church during this interrogation. He was merely a tool of God to be used. Because there, you read certain commentaries, or you read certain things with people. I mean, they put a high premium. Oh, Gamiel, man, that, ooh, yeah, he's a friend of the church. I wouldn't even go that far. Okay? He's still part of the system. But God used him. God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. However, we know that God was there working in and through people like Esther and Mordecai and even a pagan like Xerxes to help save God's people from annihilation so that the line of David can be preserved because from that line, who comes from that line? Jesus, who is our redeemer, who started the church. Because you can't have a church without Jesus. But God is always in the detail. God is always working. God is always the hero in our lives. And because of that, all glory belongs to him. Amen? Verse 39b, so they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing 
that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple from, and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. So it wasn't enough that they took Gamaliel's advice, but they wanted their pound of flesh. So they proceeded to beat the apostles and charge them again not to speak the name of Jesus and then release them. Now that word beat in the Greek actually means to strike with a whip. They were flogged like Jesus. Can you imagine what they were thinking when that was happening on the night that Jesus was before this same council and they flogged him at least 39 times? Now, I don't know if they were flogged or whipped 39 times, but that was the custom of the day. But what we do know is that the apostles' attitude was not of sadness or regret, but they what? Rejoiced. Okay, I'm going to tell you something. I wasn't like really like a really, I mean, I was a kind of a good kid, yeah, growing up and stuff like that, but I got whipped, all right? And then you never, ever enter the kitchen because then you realize the kitchen turns into a total armory for mom, <laughs> right? There's like weapons all over the place when mom's in the kitchen. So you never, you know, you never box yourself in the kitchen when mom's there. Everything's in, within reach, you know, it's like, I'll take the belt anytime. I don't know what mom's going to pull out. But, you know, you look and it's like, okay, but that's just a belt. Which I thank God for because that kept me out of trouble. It did. It kept me out of trouble. I always remember my dad. If you go to prison and stuff, I won't pick you up. You know, so that kept me out of trouble. But to be flogged, it was probably the same type of whip that was used on Jesus, that probably the tips, they call it the cat of nine tails or something like that. Probably have pieces of metal, glass, you name it. And the purpose of it is to not only inflict pain, but to shred your skin off your body. But what we do know is that their suffering is that the apostles' attitude was not, again, of sadness or regret, but they rejoiced when they left the council because they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus' name. Their suffering showed that they were absolutely loyal to Jesus, but their suffering also encouraged them to continue to teach the name of Jesus because every day in the temple and from house to house, so they weren't only teaching at the temple, folks, they were also going from house to house. They did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ was Jesus. In closing, my best friend Greg uh, sent me a video yesterday of his uh, son, uh, Jason, who's 42 years old, bench pressing at the gym. But Rona set him back. That's what we call coronavirus. We call her, we give her a name. Her name is Rona. But all it did was to motivate him to hit his goal for the next few months after he had uh, COVID. And the goal that he hit, he hit it big time. Nothing but 500 pounds of metal. And it, it was a beautiful, clean press. His arms weren't wobbling or anything like that. It was just pure grit and determination. I mean, he took that thing down and just put it right back up, racked it. I used to do that. No, I never did that. But no, I, I, no, no, I, never, I never lifted 500 pounds, okay? But the apostle, I mean, we can say that he would not let the opposition, setback, or obstacles of Rona stop him from moving forward and reaching his goal. The apostle would become one of the primary examples of enduring persecution, enduring obstacles, enduring oppositions and hardships and setbacks, all for the name of who? Jesus. They would actually inspire many other Christians during the early church to move forward in Jesus' name. And God used their suffering to overcome spiritual opposition and move forward in reaching their goal 
in sharing the gospel as effective witnesses of Jesus, and that is the same for us. And I close with this scripture from James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kind, for you know that the testing of your faith produces, what? Steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Amen? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this, for your word, Lord. We thank you for the truth of your word, the power of your word. And Lord, yes, you know, suffering doesn't seem like a popular thing, Lord, but we know and we understand as your children, Lord, that you allow suffering because it's in suffering, Lord, that our faith grows, our, suff- our suffering, Lord, our faith, Lord, it, 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 it becomes more steadfast, Lord. But Lord, I thank you that we do not go through suffering by ourselves, but that we have the help, we have the comforter, we have the, we have the, the peace and the help of the Holy Spirit that indwells within us to endure the sufferings this side of heaven. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are there to help us to deal with these external oppositions or setbacks that can happen in our own lives or that can happen within our church family. But Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, Lord, and that you're always there in our time of need. And we praise you and we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen.